Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Spicer. The title of my talk is Kubernetes Plus Monolith, Good for Humans and Good for Computers. This talk is super informal. Please hoot, holler, hiss, boo, whatever you got. Let's hear it. Uh, up first on the agenda, I'm going to give some introductions about me, about Squarespace. Um, I'm going to talk about why Kubernetes, why not Kubernetes, uh, how we did it, the results, uh, and then a few questions at the end. If you have questions in the middle, just raise your hand. I'll get to you. Let's, let's keep it informal. But first, some introductions. Uh, again, my name is Mark Spicer. I'm a software engineer in infrastructure engineering. Uh, that means I write backend software. I focus on reliability. I write Go, Java, sometimes Python, those types of things. A little bit about Squarespace. We were founded in 2003. Uh, we have over 2 million websites on our platform, uh, 963 employees worldwide, approximately. Um, our platform, we have a Java monolith. Uh, it's one code base. Uh, produces two binaries, and we run that in 11 different fleet variations. We have approximately 160 microservices. That's anywhere from Java, Python, and Go. Um, since we were founded in 2003, we are bare metal. We're on-prem. Uh, that means we run our Kubernetes clusters on bare metal as well. Uh, so first up, why Kubernetes? Uh, deployments is the, was one of the primary things that uh, we didn't do well here at Squarespace. Um, our deployment strategy kind of stunk. Uh, we used Ansible. It was a playbook. Um, over time, they grew, uh, turned into multiple playbooks. They differed via environments. Uh, we had a bunch of custom checks. Uh, every now and then, we'd have a bad deploy, and we would make a PR to add another uh, check. And eventually, this came really homegrown and, and well overgrown. Uh, the other issue with this is we had two large code bases at Squarespace. We have this monolithic Java app, and then we have uh, a configuration repo for Ansible. Um, and when we wanted to change the release process, we had to tie those together in CI. And so this had all sorts of problems. Um, we, you know, we would merge changes for the release pipeline. They, they depended on code in, in the repo. We'd break one environment while the other environment's deploying. Uh, it was a mess. Uh, adding new deployment strategies was really hard. Um, we, we wanted to do blue-green deployments. And our hammer was Ansible, and we decided that Ansible was how we were going to do it. Um, it was no good. Ansible is not good at error handling. Uh, it doesn't recover well. Uh, custom modules can help. So now we can write Python, write unit tests for that. But um, now we're writing our own deployment strategies in-house, and we're trying to sh shim it into Ansible. It wasn't a good fit. Um, the, next, the next set of issues we had was operations. Uh, creating new instances became really hard. When I joined Squarespace, there was a single SRE team. Um, that SRE team grew. We then became many SRE teams. Uh, the monolith requirements also changed and more, got more complicated. Uh, to create new instances, we started uh, compiling playbooks together. Um, those playbooks multiplied, and we got uh, one too many of them. They had to be run in the correct order. Uh, if one failed, you had to restart. Um, and at the end of the day, it took several hours, uh, multiple teams, um, and it just got too unwieldy. Ansible, again, uh, for operations, if we have to restart the fleet, or we have to uh, run some sort of background, background process. Um, we had playbooks to do that. Over time, they became an artifact of, of our last run of that. Um, so we'd, we'd run the Ansible playbook. It would fail in some way, and we'd add more health checks. Um, and then during outages, uh, the playbooks would be like, the, the fleet's in a bad state. We're going to exit. And we're like, we know it's in a bad state. We want you to run anyways. And we had all these types of problems with it. Um, the other problems we had was startup and shutdown. The systems grew over time, um, and that led to no order startup or shutdown. We, we should have went back and dug into system D and, and ordered everything, um, but it, we never had time for that, and we kept moving. And so what that meant was when we restarted a server, we had to man manually intervene when it came back. Um, you know, make sure all the processes are, are on, make sure they're on in the right order. It was a bad state. Uh, we also went from one fleet variation to many. We decided one day that like, it's not a good idea to have all of the traffic go to one fleet. We should split it up into different pools. Um, and the easiest way to do that was to, to clone it and separate traffic that way. And the fleets themselves also grew. So at the end of the day, this made comp Ansible playbooks really complicated. Um, <laughs> Ansible runs would melt my laptop. The fans would kick on. File descriptors would max out. SSHD would fail. I had to restart. Um, it was bad. Uh, we ended up with recreatable pets. Uh, we could create new ones. We could survive the loss of a few. But like, they still had names, and we still tended each one. Each one still had a, had a purpose and had to be on. Uh, turns out, human interfaces have a really high latency. 
So we constantly had to work with other teams. We had tickets. Um, as we grew as a company, we just like we adopted this thing called Agile, and then we wanted to plan sprints, and then operational work had to be scheduled into those sprints. Um, and this just magnified operational toil because it was already pretty manual, and now we had to involve other teams, and those teams had responsibilities. Um, so this got even worse. Who here remembers Spectre Meltdown? This was really painful for us. Um, service owners don't care about their kernels, like what's a kernel? Our compute team doesn't own the service, and so like they were unsure, can the application handle a restart? How fast can it happen? How many can be offline? Is it stateful? Was it accidentally stateful and the service owner didn't know? Um, there was no contract between the platform and the services that ran there. Um, so this, this meant questions like, who owns kernel upgrades was really hard to answer. Um, you know, and then there were expectations in both directions that were pretty incompatible. Service owners, um, you know, computer said computers ever experienced failure, right? And, and uh, the compute team's like, your application can be restarted in the same manner, right? Um, and both of those expectations were slightly wrong in different ways. Um, so why not Kubernetes? I think the biggest problem we had at Squarespace was fear. Um, you know, we, we had been running Kubernetes for about a year. We had a significant uh, migration of microservices by that time. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, the monolith pays all of our salaries. Um, the stakes are a lot higher now. Um, questions like, is the mat platform mature enough was a real question. And this turned into like a chicken and egg problem. Um, how do we gain confidence in platform maturity if we don't put our most mature software on the platform? Um, Management built their careers on VMs, and this is a brand new ball game. Um, you know, this at first glance, Kubernetes kind of feels like magic. Um, under the hood, we tell them it's just, uh, you know, C groups and, and IB tables, so it's fine. Um, but it, this also became a threat to, you know, management losing touch with their technical skills, and switching to a new paradigm could widen that gap. Uh, lack of knowledge, you know. At least with VMs, we have this like tribal knowledge about how the system operates. You know, it might not be well documented, but there's a few people around that who really know how that system works. Um, if we migrate to Kubernetes, will we put all that knowledge into one or two people? Um, and that was a that was a reasonable fear. Um, the next problem was NFS. When we started the Kubernetes migration, we still relied on NFS. Um, we had user data in the range of petabytes mounted via NFS to the monolith. Uh, and I'm getting pretty nervous just like talking about it up here. Um, as a dependency of the monolith, it was going to have to be available in Kubernetes. Um, observability. We relied on Graphite at the time. Uh, I, I wasn't sure if I had to ask who knows Graphite, but who knows Graphite here? Um, Graphite's a metrics, a push-based metric system. Um, Graphite allocates enough, the way we had it configured, allocated enough storage space for a year for every new metric path created. Um, we added host paths into the metric, into the metric path to avoid collisions, and this means our like dynamic pod names uh, most certainly was going to exhaust the storage in our graphite cluster. In fact, we had a hack week project to put v6 on Kubernetes, our monolith onto Kubernetes. Uh, we generated over a terabyte of metrics in a six-hour period, and our observability team was very upset with us. So confirmed, graphite is not going to work in the in its current form. Our alerts were all in Sensu. Who knows Sensu? Uh, Sensu is an alert, uh, alerting, alerting tool. Um, it checks, it has a bunch of checks and those checks have handlers, um, uh, but they all run on, a, they expect an instance level uh, type of alerting. Like is the, is the process on, does it respond to HTTP? Um, there's, there's no way of doing service level alerting. So like we'd get a single, a uh, single node would be in a bad, bad state and we get a page for it. Uh, and so that really wasn't going to work with Kubernetes. We really needed service level alerting. Um, you know, single instance alerts no longer really make sense in Kubernetes, but also like if we went, decided we want to keep with Sensu, what, what would that even look like? Uh, a sidecar running in the pod, checking if the other processes are on in that pod, it's, it gets, it's weird, it's gross. Um, the next challenge we have is service discovery. We had service discovery for services for quite some time, uh, but we had never fully migrated the mon monolith over. Um, we had a static fleet in our load balancer and the static set of VMs, so it, it was no big deal. Uh, there was a little bit of organizational concern if discovery was going to be safe there. And so this technical problem turned into a little bit of a political roadblock. Okay, so enough with the why or why not, how did we do it? 
uh, management. We've got to convince the manager first. Uh, asking to put the entire monolith on Kubernetes up front would have been a really hard sell. And reasonably so. We didn't prove that it was going to work yet. We had no evidence of the of solutions to the roadblocks that we mentioned before. And like they would have been high bars if we were going to do that all up front before we're getting started. So instead, we decided to start with our asynchronous job processor. We call it AUX. Um, it was a safe bet. If, if a job failed, we'd requeue re it. The user wouldn't notice it's already supposed to be asynchronous. Um, and that, this allowed us to not have to answer all of those tough questions up front. And management was happy. Observability. But first, we need visibility into what we're running into Kubernetes. Um, so we started by migrating the monolith to Prometheus. Um, we used the Prometheus operator. For those un unaware of what an operator is, you can apply a custom resource definition to Kubernetes, and there's a background loop that will make sure that those things exist in the environment. Um, okay, a tangent about namespacing before we go any further. Uh, we started with a namespace per team, and we thought this is going to be great. Every team is going to have their own Prometheus. We go from this massive graphite cluster to every team owning their own Prometheus instance. This is going to be wonderful. Don't do this. Uh, the biggest thing we realized uh, is that services change. Uh, they change ownership. They change from one team to another. And what that meant was a redeploy and a migration from one production environment to another production environment. That's weird. We shouldn't have to do that. Like the service is just changing team. We shouldn't have, we shouldn't have to change the way it's running in production. So we switched to application-based namespaces and, and we have been happy ever since. Uh, we built a namespace operator. Um, so what this allows us to do is to apply, apply a simple YAML definition and we'd get everything we needed out of the box to run a new application. So a Prometheus pair, push gateway, alert manager was all set up to go. Um, all this came for free as part of the platform. We gave, uh, we have certain config, uh, config maps that are available everywhere. And so we can update those and have the namespace operator update that everywhere. This is what it looks like. It's very simple. You give it a service name, you give it a team name, uh, and everything else gets configured for you. We have uh, a slew of other options that you can configure if you need to be specific about what you want to run in your environment. But the most, use, most normal case is just saying, this is a service I want to exist, and this is the team that's going to own this service. Uh, so all of this work allowed us to put our VMs and our pods on the same dashboard. Um, so we could see, uh, are they performing the same? Are they getting the same number of requests, et cetera? Uh, we also migrated our alerts to service level alerting. We use Alert Manager, and now we have no more single process alerts. We can alert on the fleet as a whole. This also means we could alert across VMs and pods, which means we can deploy both and still get alerted for uh, failures across either of them. Next up is training. We started an internal Kubernetes training program. This was super helpful for us. Uh, we created a Kubernetes 101 and 201 courses, and every engineer of the company has gone through these courses. Um, most managers have gone through these courses and some, some directors have gone through them as well. And so this allowed us to train our entire engineer, uh, set of engineers on how to use Kubernetes. Uh, by the time we were done, more people know how to operate services running in Kubernetes and VMs. Um, this is a success. Management's happy, infrastructure is happy, and products is happy because now they know how to run their services. So okay, the actual migration, how do we do it? We started with asynchronous job processing, but specifically we had a job whitelist. This allowed us to single, uh, trial a single job there and make sure it worked. Um, it allowed us to skirt the NFS problem because we didn't have that figured out yet. Um, and up until this point, we had a lot of work invested in uh, monitoring, uh, deployments, getting that all working correctly. So we needed a win to say, OK, we did all this, this extra work. Let's actually do something and see what it runs. Um, we quickly re realized we're going to need NFS because there's a lot of jobs that rely on, on storage. Um, we found issues in mounting NFS directly into the containers. There was too many connects and disconnects for our legacy storage appliance. Um, so instead, we used host path mounting. We mounted NFS volumes to the host. Every Kubernetes uh, node in our cluster has NFS mounts. And then we presented that via host path mounting. So it was essentially mounting a, a local disk image to the pod instead. And this made it look much similar to the way we did it on VMs. We also created a risk matrix to discover unknown unknowns. So here we have the components on the left-hand side and the operations along the top. And there's a lot of stuff going on here, but the important note is uh, we made an X for anywhere where a component and an operational task would overlap. Um, and then we highlighted in blue scenarios that we wanted to test. 
Um, we then created an NFS testing plan. We conducted a series of tests and then we documented the results. Um, this gave a lot of confidence to a lot of folks in the organization because now we knew how it was going to perform in production because we actually tested it. Uh, okay, cool. So this got all of our asynchronous job processing onto Kubernetes, uh, but what about the, the synchronous processes? We needed service discovery in place to move forward. Um, we have used co console for service discovery for services for quite some time. We were used to that. It was never fully configured for the monolith. Um, we needed a, a routing layer that was uh, shimmed in between that allowed us to um, route to pods and VMs at the same time. Envoy allowed us to do that. Um, and we needed a custom control plane to handle the interaction between the two, and we call that mesh discovery we wrote in-house. Um, the next thing that was really helpful is feature gates. And these were super simple. We said in the deployment spec, if stage, uh, deploy. If not, don't deploy. Uh, that was super helpful for, to us because we were able to deploy to certain environments or certain fleets uh, and see how they perform independently. We also typically did one, one of many or one to three of many, uh, which means maybe if the fleet was 50 instances total, we'd run one to three of them in Kubernetes. Um, and this, this allowed us to validate the deployments against the VM counterparts and make sure there was no discrepancies. Uh, from there, we could scale up slowly and ramp up slowly in, in Kubernetes and only move on when we felt comfortable. The other thing we did was we never turned off the VMs. Uh, management along the way was like, well, maybe we can turn off the VMs uh, and save some compute capacity. And we were like, no, we can't do this. Um, keeping the VMs around allowed us to scale to zero as soon as we ran into problems in Kubernetes and it was really helpful to us. Also, when we thought that we're ready to go, let's, let's turn off the VMs, um, Kubernetes is good to go. We just stopped the app and we we're gonna wait for two weeks. Turns out we really needed that. Uh, we had an emergency, we had to get the VMs back online. Um, we scaled down the pods and everything was fine. Um, only after we felt comfortable with the, everything running in Kubernetes did we delete all of the VMs. Okay, so what are the results? Uh, deployments, we significantly reduced the production deployment times. We went from 50 minutes to six minutes in Kubernetes. Um, there's a bunch of things going on here. One thing, we're much better with artifacts. We had a zippered artifact that we were passing around before. Um, now we're using containers and we primed them on every host. We made sure they were there. We cut out most of our Ansible boilerplate and that became replaced with Kubernetes primitives. So we cut out all of our custom YAML, which it felt really bad. And, and now we have a well-tested API that we're deploying against. And so these things are like health checks and validations and everything else became a lot faster and more reliable. Uh, we can now create new instances really fast. That 1.5 hours is now 1.5 minutes. Like it's real, it's nuts. Um, this means we can also double our fleet size in a minute and a half. Um, as mentioned, we, we have all the binaries primed everywhere. The environment's ready to go. And so uh, when we tell Kubernetes we want more, it's just starting more processes instead of deploying new apps. Um, and so that's a really big difference that really helped us here. Yes? This is on-prem. Um, we can let Kubernetes uh, roll the fleet now. Um, this is a patch command. Um, this is just telling the deployment, hey, add this weird annotation that just adds a new date. Um, but what that allows us to do uh, is roll the Kubernetes uh, deployment as if, or roll the Kubernetes uh, fleet as if it was another deploy which is pretty cool because now all the health checks that we had defined um, and everything else all just work as if it was another deployment. Is your container registry on-prem as well? Yes. What are you using for a container registry? We're using Key currently or Quay, uh, depending on which part of the world you were from. <laughs> uh, so interfaces, what, what was the benefit here? Um, the compute platform now has clear expectations and boundaries. This is huge. Um, the compute team did a really good job rolling out Kubernetes and they set expectations out front. Um, they made sure that folks knew what, what that meant, putting your uh, application in Kubernetes. They made sure that people knew that it was embracing failure. Um, and now we can upgrade the cluster without notice. Service centers don't care. Kernels can be upgraded, no one notices. Uh, we're just gonna roll the fleet, drain each node, upgrade it in place, have it come back online. So it's all great, right? Uh, I have a few rants, and the first one is about sidecars. Um, so sidecar processes are like other containers you run in your pod. Um, they're really powerful, especially for legacy applications, but they're pretty sketchy, and they're mostly a trap, and here's why. 
uh, Kubernetes has no concept of ordered startup and shutdown in its current form. And so I can't say like, okay, turn off the app. Uh, once the app is down, then turn off console and Mongo S, the sidecars that we are running in our container. And we can't have them start up in that order either. We can't say start console Mongo S and then start the application. Um, this becomes a problem for draining requests. There's no draining state for a pod. It's, uh, it's, it goes from running to terminating. Uh, so, and so for our monolith, we have a couple things we need to do. Uh, we need a draining state. We need to be able to remove from service discovery, wait for that to propagate, and then like wait for a few requests to complete, and then turn off. We can't have our sidecars getting a SIG term during this period, or all those requests are going to fail. So li lifecycle hooks help. Um, there's a po post start and a pre stop. Um, they help out a bit, but they're still not great. Uh, they can conduct an HTTP request or call an execu executable in a container. Um, and so this means we can have pre-stop hooks that wait uh, until the application turns off before we turn off our sidecars. But there's a problem with that still. Um, public Docker images are mutable. They have uh, a tag and they can change that out from under the hood on you. Typically, you'll version your software for the version of software they're running in the container. But let's say we want to upgrade Debian from one version to another. Does that warrant a, a Mongo version upgrade? Probably not. And so this means one day your sidecar will have curl inside it and the next day it might not. And this actually happened to us. Um, Lifecycle hooks, they do error, but they're not very loud. And we went several months before realizing this was going on. Um, yes, so lifecycle hooks, they help. We also uh, vendor all of our images at this point now to make sure this will never happen again. Uh, so, to wrap up, Kubernetes felt like a silver bullet to us. And I think for the most part, it really was. It solved a lot of problems that we had. Uh, Kubernetes promises a ton and delivers on most of it. So 10 out of 10 would definitely recommend Kubernetes. Any questions? Uh, you mentioned you do training internally at 101 and 201. How often do you run those courses? Uh, I th I think about once a month, is that right? We def twice a month. We also run them for all new hires. So we have a new hire set of training materials that we have for all new hires who come on board, and we put that as part of that as well. Mentioned uh, the images and the public images, the, the rate of updates that happen in these images. And you also mentioned that you have your own uh, container registry. Do you guys build your own images now? And uh, what images were used in public images, what, what the, the trade-offs there? Yeah, that's a great question. So things like console or Mongo S for public images we were using. Uh, a couple of the negative sides we saw was um, our deployments now were dependent on the Docker registry being up, which is not a great scenario to be in. Because um, not only did we, it, even if the container was cached, we still had to make the HTTP request and say like, is there an updated version of this? Um, and so that was really bad. So we've, we, we've entered directly. We just Docker pulled, Docker pushed. Um, that was really helpful. Moving forward, we're looking to build uh, a common set of binaries for pre-stop uh, and pre-start and put them in every container that we build. And that way, you know that you can call this binary and make sure that it's going to wait for the application to stop. With cluster upgrades, how are you managing that? Uh, we still do that via Ansible. Uh, Ansible is our configuration management tool of choice, unfortunately. I have negative feelings about Ansible. Sorry. Um, it, we have Ansible playbooks that would drain the node, wait for, wait till it completes, um, you know, turn it off. We schedule all of our hardware maintenance during that time too. So firmware upgrades are going to happen at that time. Um, we do it all at once. We do about that about once a quarter. I think, I think Quay, K Quay is, uh, I think it's moving to, moving its native uh, uh, container builder to, to build, right? And are you guys planning to migrate to that or is it just gonna remain with uh, Doc? Uh, uh, no, so we, we rely on drone for most of our builds in-house. Uh, we're also looking, uh, our release team is looking to implement Artifactory, mostly because we have um, multiple different artifact storage systems and it's getting really hard to manage, you know, Quay and Nexus and NPM on site and things like that. Uh, you mentioned services that are running in this cluster. Are they usually web services or do you have any persistent services like databases and streams running inside our cluster? Uh, so no databases. Um, 
I think there are some toy databases out there, but there's no guarantees that those are going to be running, and we make sure everybody knows that that's the case. Um, streams, we have gRPC streams, if that's what you mean, or if there's a different type of streams. Oh, Kafka streams. Nope, we don't run any of that there. I think we're touring with the idea of running some of our Elasticsearch uh, items there, um, but that, that is all the further we've gotten with that. Uh, that means that you guys are going to use the persistent claims and stateful sets, right? Yes. Uh, that, maybe that's a good point. Uh, all of our Promethei run in Kubernetes, and they all have persistent volume claims, uh, and we, we're, we back that by Ceph currently. One more. Anybody? Any takers? How many data centers? We have two. Uh, and there's about three Kubernetes cluster per data center. Uh, Any nodes? I don't know if I can talk about that. All right. <laughs> but please come come chat with me afterwards. Uh, love to chat with you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much.